if you look at males, it turns out that in a number of animals, males who have a relatively broad face are more aggressive. There was a Canadian team that looked at hockey teams and looked at the number of minutes that individual players spent in the penalty box for being too aggressive. There was a positive relationship between breadth of the face and the number of minutes spent in the penalty box. Is it right to say that humans are an aggressive species, do you think? Well, yes, uh, in some ways we are incredibly aggressive because uh, we are responsible for more deaths of members of our own species than is typical of other animals. And yet at the same time, of course, you know, the great paradox about us is that in some ways we're just incredibly nice and tolerant and friendly and unaggressive. Um, and for years, we grappled with how to resolve these two contrary sides of our personality. But we cannot deny that part of us is, uh, is a really aggressive streak. And we're seeing it at the moment in, in wars that occur around the world. And, um, and those, of course, have gone on throughout history. What does it suggest about human nature or what our role is or what would be adaptive for us that we seem to be very effective at the barbell ends of aggression? Well, you know, one of the great questions about human nature for uh, two or three hundred years has been, are we biologically predisposed to be aggressive or are we biologically predisposed to be tolerant? Are we a, an inherently aggressive species that is tamed by society? Or are we a, an inherently tolerant, unaggressive species that is made aggressive by society? And, and you know, my view, and I think the increasing view, is that that's, that question is misconceived. You know, because the answer is that we're both or neither, if you like. That whether or not you look at our our tremendous capacity and even interest in committing um, aggression, uh, or whether you look at our tolerant uh, aversion to aggression, both of them are part of our biology. So I think that what we're learning about ourselves is that we have to recognize that we are a mixture. And society is not responsible either for taming us or for uh, making us the the sometimes horrible species that we sometimes are. You know, th this is us. Take us or leave it. Who were the two philosophers that had this big push? Was one, it wasn't Foucault. Who was the one, who was the French guy? Went and lived the in French the woods. The French guy was Jean-Jacques Rousseau. That was it. Sounds like Foucault, uh, Foucault. yeah. You know, writing just, uh, just before the French Revolution uh, at the end of the 18th century. Um, and... Um, and, and, you know, sort of very ironic, really, you know, because he has become associated with the notion that we are inherently nonviolent. And, of course, everyone had such high hopes for the French Revolution. And then, you know, this this wonderful, charitable, uh, exotic new dawn of humanity turns into the guillotine and, uh, and then, you know, Napoleon uh, and so on. You know, the, the disaster that, uh, that befell uh, the... The, the sort of growing sense of civilization uh, in Europe at that time. And then the other great philosopher, so, he, so Rousseau was associated with the notion that, that humans are inherently um, unaggressive, are made, made aggressive by society. And, uh, and then the opposite side was Thomas Hobbes, who was living in the time of the English Civil War uh, in the second half of the uh, 17th century, and uh, and he was impressed by the fact that uh, you really had to lock your door and uh, you had to worry about who your neighbours were because uh, they might come and kill you. And you know the civil war was a terrible thing, and so he was associated with the notion that uh, there is something just inherently competitive, uh, uh, cruel, violent about humans, and that what you need to be able to control them is a superior body, a, a, an, an ultimate authority. Uh, he called it a leviathan. Uh, we would now think about it as the state. You know, at that time, it might have been the, the monarch um, to keep everybody under control. And, and you can look at uh, both of these, these great philosophers who have been 
representing these two opposing views, uh, you know, superficially opposing views, and think that in many ways both of them were right. You know, they, they had a lot to them, and that's, that's why people have sort of supported one or the other over these years. But, um, uh, you know, the wonderful thing is that we can now put the, uh, the nature of human nature into a much broader perspective than ever was done by political philosophers who were basically, of course, sitting in their armchairs, you know, I mean, from the point of view of modern science. They weren't trying to, to really figure out what was going on in terms of the wet biology or in terms of our evolutionary relationships. Uh, but we can do that now. And, and we can look at our close relatives, uh, the great apes, and we can see elements of uh, all the, these two contrasting types of behavior in our cousins. And the fascinating thing about that is not that we can say, oh, well, you know, we have inherited a particular kind of quality from a particular kind of ape. But instead, what we can see is that evolution works in you know, fascinating ways to generate in one species uh, a certain level of uh, some kinds of aggression and another species at different kinds of aggression. And we can figure out that there is a, a logic to the evolutionary history that leaves us deposited, in our case, in the 20th century or 21st century, um, with a particular set of inherent tendencies. What do you think is the evolutionary story of human, what we are now, our uh, ancestors' journey through aggression? I think that we have to look back at the last two million years, which is the time that we have been members of the genus Homo. You know, just a, around two million years ago is when the genus Homo arose, when for the first time you got a creature that... Uh, could walk into a, uh, a clothes shop on Main Street and take clothes off the peg. You know, they were our size and shape. Um, they were smaller brained. They were much more robust. Uh, they were you know, big, great big barrages and great big broad faces. Uh, but they were, they were an early kind of human two million years ago. And I think that for the whole of the two million years, they were a species that were like wolves or chimpanzees or a few other uh, species in being very good hunters and also very good killers of your own species. Because once, you, once you're a good hunter, you know, like a lion or a wolf or a chimpanzee, then it means that you can hunt anything. And if you want to hunt a member of your own species, you're pretty good at that. That weaponry can be turned inward, yes. Yes, and it's not literally weaponry in the sense of a, of a spear. You know, it's the weapons of your claws and your and your brain and your mouth and and whatever it is. And and in the case of of actually all the species I mentioned, the really important weapon is a coalition. It's your gang. It's ganging up for five of us against one of you. Because when you do that, then you make yourself safe. And none of these hunters will go out on their own and try and attack. You know, a, a wolf doesn't go out and, and try and a, a, attack a bison on its own. You know, it knows perfectly well that it'd be an incredibly dangerous thing to do. But if you have 10 wolves and one bison, well, now you're talking. You know, some of them can nip the, the uh, its uh, rear end while the others are confronting it at the front and so on, you know. There's great advantage in numbers. And that is the way that humans have always tended to attack and kill other humans. It's through the advantage of numbers or surprise or other tactical arrangements um, that um, enable them to kill safely. So if you're asking, what is the evolutionary story of human aggression? I think the story that carries all the way through to to, to modern warfare is that we were good at hunting and we turned the hunting ability against members of our own species when it suited us to do so. And just, you know, we see this in war nowadays because war consists of a series of asymmetric attacks. We bomb their side, they, they bomb us. 
it's an asymmetric attack in the sense that it's a pretty premeditated, planned attack when it's pretty safe for the attackers. What's not safe is what happens later when they attack us. So that's one kind of aggression. Wolf-like, chimp-like, lion-like. That's humans throughout the period of the genus Homo. The other kind of aggression is something that is um, probably uh, the big event that changed everything happened around three or four hundred thousand years ago. And this is the invention of or the development of a sufficiently skilled language that groups of men were able to kill members of their own group using that same coalitionary ability, that same gang. But the huge complication when you are forming a gang against a member of your own group is how the dickens do you know that the ones that you hope are going to be in your gang aren't going to turn against you and you, as, say, the instigator of a gang, let's go and get that guy, might suddenly turn out to be the victim and they all turn against you. The, the coalitionary dynamics become terrifying if you are trying to organize a group against a member of your own group. And it's different from when you're attacking a member of another group because then you can all agree. We hate the members of that other group. But the emotions are mixed when you're talking about individuals within the same group. And the solution to that is sufficiently good language where individuals can talk to each other and get a real sense of reassurance, slowly developing, you know, just floating an idea. So, you know, that guy is a little bit weird recently, don't you think? You know? And um, eventually getting confidence that, yes, okay, let's agree. You know, he really deserves to be sent back to the witches. And, and we'll get him. And we'll all agree. And that's it. Now, this ability to execute an, another member of your own group changes society hugely because until then almost unimaginably for humans as we grow up uh, in society today we would have had a really bullying system i mean maybe it is imaginable if you remember high school you know where there is some guy at the top who really throws his weight around you know i mean not all high schools are like this but it does happen from time to time and um throws his weight around and just, you know he takes advantage of his his ability to physically dominate everybody else uh, all animals do this basically you know all the primates the chimpanzees and the gorillas even the bonobos um uh, all the monkeys you have some top male and he takes out on everybody else and what does it what does he get he gets, well, the females. And he gets the majority of the mating. He gets the best food. He gets into fights a lot, of course. But, um, but he really just bullies everybody. And once you get this ability to form a coalition that can kill a bully in your group, then all of a sudden, everything changes. Because nobody dares to be the bully that exerts his power, the tyrant that takes everything for himself. And all of a sudden, uh, you get changes in society, and then slowly you get changes in the evolution of our aggressive tendencies. And what you're doing when you take out these bullies is you are uh, doing to humans what farmers have long done to domesticated animals or to wild animals as they became domesticated. You are selecting inadvertently, in the case of humans, for the non-bullies, for the less aggressive individuals. And at this point, we have to stop, just take a breather and say, there are two kinds of aggression in animals in general, Humans are no exception, that have very distinctive dynamics. 
And the one we first talked about, the one that is involved in hunting, is a premeditated form of aggression, which is not necessarily involved in the emotions very strongly at all. It's a very deliberate kind of aggression saying to herself that I have a goal. I want to go and kill that animal or that person. I want to go and steal that gold. And if I have to kill someone to do it, I'll get it. And then the other kind of aggression, so that was called proactive, premeditated, predatory. The other kind of aggression is reactive. It's when you, as a man, uh, come into your home bedroom and find another man in bed with your wife, and you just lose it. This is not premeditated, thoughtful, unemotional. This is impulsive, it's defensive, it's reacting to a threat. And you just lash out and and uh, you, you, you are, are very emotionally aroused. And the aim here is to just get rid of that threat. Chase the guy out of the bedroom window, kill him, do whatever. And it turns out that these two kinds of aggression, proactive and reactive, are somewhat different in the way that they are controlled in the brain. And they can be uh, following different evolutionary trajectories. So you can maintain a high level of proactive aggression and have a selection acting against your reactive aggression. And that's what happened in humans starting about three or 400,000 years ago when um, proactive aggression kept going. We were great hunters all the time, but reactive aggression started going down. We became much less reactive in our aggressive tendencies. How do we know that? How do we know that date? It's beautiful. When you select a, domestic, a, a wild animal uh, and choose to have the successive generations being those that are, are uh, the result of breeding by the less aggressive, the less reactively aggressive individuals, then they show elements of um, some quite surprising biological traits. And these we know these traits very well because they occur in domesticated animals. All these different lines of domesticated animals, uh, unrelated lines, dogs, cows, goats, cats, they all tend to have white patches of fur on them. Why do they have white patches of fur? It's not because a farmer needs to have a cow that's got a white patch on its forehead or a horse that's got white toes. These just occur spontaneously. We know this now because there's this wonderful uh, Russian experiment starting in the 1950s by a guy called Dmitry Belyev, and he started breeding foxes. And lo and behold, within a few generations, the foxes got white patches of fur on them. Why is that? It's because the foxes he chose to breed were the ones that were least aggressive. He would walk towards the foxes when they were about six weeks old, when they were you know, just, just young ones. And he would write down the distance that the human would uh, get within the fox, with a, as they approached the fox, when the fox said, ah! that was it reacting. And then he would breed from the ones that allowed the humans to get closest, the least reactively aggressive. And in 10 generations, they got white patches of fur. Hello? There's something mysterious going on here. And we're beginning to get a handle on what it is about the biology that says when you select against reactive aggression, you develop these symptoms of the domestication syndrome like white patches of fur. Another one is floppy ears. There is no wild animal. Actually, there's, there are, there's only one kind of wild animal that has floppy ears. Do you know what it is? Elephant? Yes, very good. Nailed Top it. Class. Boom. Uh, that's, that's what Darwin pointed out. He said, but all the domesticated animals, you will find some individuals and some, some groups that have got floppy ears. Um, and uh, the floppy ears, uh, you know, they're associated with young ones in wolves, but in, in many dogs, they retain those floppy ears all the way through adulthood, into adulthood. So this is a, 
another feature of the domestication syndrome. Well, now, obviously, humans don't have floppy ears. Um, or white and fur. We, what? Or white fur. Well, um, we don't often have uh, white patches of fur. But, um, but there are some features of the domestication syndrome that are associated with our bones. And they are things like relatively uh, slender, light-boned compared to our ancestors, shorter faces, smaller chewing teeth, males becoming more female-like. And guess what? All of these things started happening around 300,000 years ago and just became more and more developed with time. And so that's why we can say that was selection against reactive aggression starting at that time, and that's why we've ended up relatively reduced in our tendency for reactive aggression, unlike our very well-maintained, unfortunately, tendency for proactive aggression. Okay, let's let's recap the story so far. So humans, our ancestors, develop the ability to, first off, uh, coalitionally hunt, that then allows them to take down bigger prey. That is something which can get turned inward. But for the next one and a half million years, you have the problem of co- a little bit more. You have the problem of coordination up until about four hundred to three hundred thousand years ago. When you yeah. get language, especially advanced language, you yeah. have the ability to coordinate more effectively. Not only do you have the uh, literal weapons of the size and the shape and the fists and the teeth and now the tools that we've been using, the spears and the arrows, perhaps. Uh, But you also have the ability to plan in advance to be able to also gauge the reliability of your other coalitional members and to be able to say, right, we're going to take him down because he's been a dick. So it's it's time for him to go. What that ends up happening is a self-domestication of humans by humans where the most aggressive, mostly males, I'm going to guess, will be pruned off the top the ones that are too tyrannical end up being executed by the remainder of the group what this means is that those ones some of them very well may have ended up reproducing before they were executed but on average you're going to have a lower level of reproduction from those individuals and if they have sons they like the aggressive son hypothesis i suppose uh, if you have aggressive sons they are more likely to be killed before they have sons and so on and so forth uh, which means that over time the most aggressive males are removed now this is a relatively short period of time you know 300,000 years ago doesn't sound like long for us to have been doing this but as you've identified in only the space of between five and ten generations of foxes you're able to see a a pretty rapid uh, anatomical change with regards to the fur this is met with certain anatomical changes in humans which includes shortening of the uh, face less aggressive uh, less uh, powerful jaws less large teeth, reduced brow ridge, I'm going to guess. And then you said that men or males became more female-like, which I'm going to guess means less muscle mass overall, lower bone density, et cetera, et cetera. So for the burgeoning professional athletes amongst us, maybe a little bit unhappy that those males were selected out of the group. And, you know, we see this with the difference in strength between us and chimps, right? That a chimp could easily rip a human limb from limb or so I've heard. Uh, And that means that we have very much not only um, adapted to the selective pressures outwardly that the environment gave to us, but almost kind of adapted to the selective pressures that we placed on ourselves socially yeah. through this execution. Is that about right? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. So, so we have been very responsible for our own evolutionary trajectory uh, for the last you know, quarter of a million years and more. And and you say, you know, it, it all seems to be relatively recent and it's true, but of course we, we have an excellent fossil record. And so, you know, we know very well that there have been these changes going pretty continuously uh, for the last quarter of a million years and more. How um, can you talk about psychological changes compared with our ancestors who are no longer around? It's not like you can study our ancestors 300,000 years ago, you can see the anatomical changes, but even those are mostly wasted away apart from what's left in terms of bone and teeth structure. 
How can you talk about the implied psychological changes? Well, I mean, the only way we can really do it uh, confidently is through this correlation with, with the bones. And uh, there are some correlations that are you know, still very fascinating today. I mean, one of them is uh, concerns the breadth of the face uh, in relationship to the length of the face. And uh, it turns out that uh, in, in a number of animals, and humans is one of them, uh, if you look at males, males who have a relatively broad face are more aggressive. And there have been a bunch of studies which show that this is true for humans nowadays. So it's, uh, you know, our, the breadth of our faces has been reduced. Uh, it has become, in, in males, more female-like, uh, relatively narrow faces. Uh, here's a, a lovely example of a study. Um, which I think makes a couple of important points. Um, there was a, a Canadian team that looked at uh, ice hockey, as we would call it, or hockey as uh, we would call it in the States, uh, uh, looked at uh, a, a number of college hockey teams and a number of professional hockey teams, and looked at the number of minutes that individual players spent in uh, the penalty box for being too rough, being, for being too aggressive. And of course, it's interesting to think about this because uh, you know, what we're going to see is that the players who had broader faces spend more time in the penalty box on average. Uh, but the referees are not really particularly aware of this because they've got helmets on. So you can't, you know, you, it's difficult to even it's know. It's not that. like it's prejudiced by the referees against the Thank broad-faced you. community, right? Exactly, that's right. An important point in this study was that for each of the study, each of the teams that they looked at, there was a, a positive relationship between breadth of the face and the number of minutes spent in the penalty box. But in no case was it significant, statistically significant. That is to say, it's not a very strong relationship uh, within each team, but in every team it happened every college team and every professional team. I think it was a, a, a total of 12 teams. So that the overall significance was very clear. But you cannot look at an, in, an individual man and say, yeah, you know, you've got a broad face. We know that you are <laughs> an aggressive type. Fits. You're going to punch me. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Wow. So, so it's a trend. You know. Okay. So what is... You mentioned about the changes that would have happened with regards to mostly male-to-male -male aggression. What is interesting, or is there anything that you know about changes which occurred to females? Were females self-domesticated uh, at all throughout this period? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's harder to know. I mean, we we don't have the same kind of uh, evidence concerning females. So you're saying that the uh, female from 300,000 years ago would have been able to walk into the department store and garner fewer looks, perhaps, than the male because, on average, they would have changed less? Is that right to say? Well, um... We'd have to know, give her a makeover it, before she went in, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, we, we, what we don't have with females is... Um, the equivalent evidence of uh, the changes that were happening in males, independent of the males. Um, you know, it seems to me very likely that females were indeed um, much more sort of independent um, uh, aggressors in those days. Um, but we don't know. The reason I say that is because in some ways, females have changed particularly strongly compared to um, our sort of uh, apish past, compared to males. You know, the males are still a little bit more brutish, um, a little bit less refined, a little bit hairier, um, uh, a, a little bit more like our uh, apish ancestors and, and the, you know, the early forms of homo. So females have in many ways changed particularly strongly. They've become, you know, feminization has really changed them from, um, from what they probably were, which was a, a much more uh, male-like 
uh, set of individuals. But but we don't have at the moment um, any kind of really clear story involving how that happened. It, was that just a an incidental consequence of selection on males? It doesn't seem very likely, but it's a theoretical possibility. Um, or uh, was there intense selection on females to become less aggressive themselves? That could well well be the case. Oh, interesting, because the ability, the male-male ability to coordinate more complex coalitions to physically take down a male would have had a similar impact on female capacity to form coalitions. I've been learning a lot about uh, intersexual competition, your Joyce Benenson's of the world and so on and so forth have been on the show a lot. And um, the female capacity for gossip and coalition making, breaking, backbiting, venting and all the rest of it is otherworldly. And it, it, it has to have been the difference as well between the way that males display um, power struggles, aggression, um, the uh, comp competitions for status, who it is that they're concerned about with status, the fact that men are positively um, inclined toward a member of their group who is stronger than them or better than them at a thing because typically that coalition would have meant well if we've got to go take down that mammoth together richard you look like you've got a good set of biceps on you that means that we can you can grab it and i'll get it with the spear or i don't know how you take down a, a mammoth um the women on the other hand have such an unbelievable divergence in the way that they go about things so it seems like it would make sense to me that this increased coordination coalitional capacity would have caused women during that period as well to have opened up a whole new world of uh, intrigue. Changes. Yes, for sure. Yeah, and no, it's it's very plausible. Um, there's another dynamic as well, which is that uh, the evolution of patriarchy. Ooh, what do you mean there? Well, the, uh, humans, I think, can be thought of as having two kinds of patriarchy. Uh, one is the the sort of more individualistic, the type that occurs in uh, animals, where a male can beat up on a female just because he's bigger than her, because he's stronger. Uh, he can dominate her. But there's another type as well, and that is a, what you might call institutional patriarchy, where within the group uh, there are rules that develop uh, in the society as a whole that benefit men at the expense of women. What would be a, an ancestral example of one of those? Um, you could say um, that uh, uh, females who have adulterous relationship uh, are going to be punished more heavily than males who do, which is something that happens pretty much universally. You know, across societies, it's a, it's extremely common, and you never get it in the other direction. You never find that males are punished more heavily than females. So, you know, I think what's going on here is that you have uh, an alliance among the males. They don't like it when females uh, are adulterous because each of the females belongs to a particular male. Let me fold a very interesting piece of information that I learned a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I want to say that this was maybe Christina Durante or someone else who taught me that women condemn promiscuity more the more sons that they have because no. they want the male parental uncertainty. They want to tune that down. So women who have sons show an increased uh, uh, distaste for promiscuity. Uh, and I thought that that was absolutely fascinating. So yes, I wonder, absolutely. I wonder how much it's just, uh, it's just the men that would have been behind the condemnation of the promiscuous women. I mean, you, you know, you roll intrasexual competition into this and you say, well, I have a man what we actually want to do in almost like a form of capital punishment to be able to show this is what happens if you do that. Now, if you were a single woman, that's one fewer competition, uh, one fewer competitor within your mating market for a future potential mate. And if you are a partnered up woman, 
that would be one fewer potential competitor for your existing mate. And if you're a woman who has sons, that is one fewer potentially promiscuous male parental uncertainty inducing partner for one of your sons. So I actually think that there might be some motivation yeah. for women here as well. Yeah, and then if, if, if a woman has daughters, then uh, she would quite like her daughters <laughs> to be able to have the choice uh, of, of um, you know, cho choosing which man she has for which, which baby. Promiscuous women have got, I mean, aside from the, the whole slut-shaming thing, uh, it's, there are a lot of pressures from pretty much everywhere and a lot of incentives from both men and women ancestrally and in the modern world to really i mean that's not to say that there isn't against male promiscuity too but it definitely seems like uh yeah there's a lot of pressure for for women to tune down that promiscuity yeah and and i mean so when you had um men taking it out on the tyrant uh take in other words taking it out on the alpha male uh by ultimately killing him in so they're controlling anybody who is taking more than his fair share of the females, which until then he always did as the alpha male. You know, the alpha chimp takes a big share of paternity. But after that, then um, it's a really important feature of uh, belonging to the alpha alliance that every male gets a female. What's the alpha alliance? The Alpha Alliance uh, is, is what I call the, the group of males who are responsible for um, killing the tyrant. Ah, uh, okay, and, okay. And so they, they, they become the leaders of the, the society. And, and of course, once they have discovered that they can kill the tyrant, then that means they can kill anybody. Including each other. Including each other. So, so there's this tremendous... Um, selection for in favor of conformity in favor of all the emotions that show that you are part of the gang um, but also uh, it imposes tremendous pressures on females because from now on any female who goes against the norms that are imposed by the alpha alliance is going to be vulnerable to herself being executed and and you you see you know horrendous accounts in uh, the hunter gatherer ethnographies of the nineteenth and eighteenth centuries, um, where people were still getting glimpses of what it was really like to be hunter gatherers before the missions had come in and the governments had come in to to get rid of all of the um, more uh, violent forms of of interaction. And and you get these stories of you know a, a woman who um, has uh, committed adultery, uh, she gets killed. A woman who has even seen the sacred trumpets of the men, killer. What what's what do you mean? What sacred trumpets? Well, uh, men often have rituals that um, are associated with the reasons or the justifications. For males being dominant over females. Uh, so, uh, you know, the sacred trumpets, uh, I, you know, I mean, these, these are things that literally you can find in, in particular societies, but they're iconic of uh, the, the justifications that men produce. Uh, you know, why, sh why, should the, why should you men, you know, always get the, the best food, right, which they tend to do. They, 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 the meat, uh, the females will get some, but the males will get the best, the best opportunities. Why should even the men get? Well, you know that's what the gods say. Whoa, 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 who who said the gods said that? We go off and we talk to the gods. The sacred trumpet. The said, sacred trumpets. I right. see. So this this is what particularly interests me that we were sort of moving now from the realm of individual. Uh, anatomical, psychological, and then societal, civilizational changes into morality. Now, we're kind of moving ourselves across into values and virtues and what is upheld and how the interplay of all of this works. Am I right in thinking... Well, actually, how, how has this impacted morality? How, how did these changes inform the evolution of human morality, in your view? I think that uh, the 
emergence of uh, what I'm calling the Alpha Alliance, the, the, the gang that is able to control the tyrant, uh, is essentially simultaneous with the evolution of, um, uh, of moral principles that are based on the concept of right and wrong. So there's a kind of morality of sympathy that you see a little bit developed in uh, the higher primates and, and maybe you know, dolphins and so on, uh, where there is a tendency for individuals just to understand, to be empathic towards uh, another individual who is suffering. And some people call that morality, and that's fine, you can call it morality, but it's not a morality based on the principles of right and wrong. Morality that's based on the principles of right and wrong is much more arbitrary. The right and wrong varies among different societies, what is right and what is wrong. And I think the way to think about it is that once you have a power group, the Alpha Alliance, that is capable of executing anybody in the group, and are therefore able to impose on the group their ideas about what benefits them from a selfish perspective, what they do is to say, here is right behavior and here is wrong behavior. You know, right behavior is, and then they'll lay out a series of things that are good for the group as a whole. Like, we're not going to steal from each other anymore, okay? Anybody caught stealing, we're going to punish you. If you carry on doing it, you're dead. But they also have a different kind of moral principle as well, which is purely selfish, not just good for the group as a whole, but good for the men. If there's any problem with the uh, food supply, the men get the first choice. If we find that uh, a man and a woman have uh, been having sex that uh, is outside, uh, let's call it marriage, well, man can be understood, but the woman, that's no good. So I think that, there are, that morality begins with the concept of right and wrong. Right and wrong is the result of what benefits the Alpha Alliance, the group that can get rid of anybody, can kill anybody because they have that ability to talk about it and do it. And there are those two ways in which they think of right and wrong. One is what's good for the group as a whole, and the other is what's good for the men. And the reason that it would be adaptive for everybody within a group to conform to that is that anybody who decides to transgress it is going to pay a very high individual price. Yeah. So yeah. In your the, in your view, does that mean that our sense of right and wrong is basically us working out how to be how to avoid being killed by small groups of alpha males? That's pretty much exactly right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> there are moral philosophers that are throwing themselves off bridges at the moment hearing <laughs> this thinking no it's good there must be more well um i i think you know this, this is a, an area of discussion that has not been you know, sufficiently aired uh, at the moment um but i feel very very comfortable uh, thinking that this all derives from uh, power dynamics that uh, that the the sense of right and wrong is ultimately a sense of how to protect yourself from this um, evolutionary novelty, which is the fact that individuals can be killed at very low cost to the killers. Do you have any inclination? Uh, is there any suggestion that this sense of right and wrong exists outside of culture? That you know, is it that each generation must learn what is right and what is wrong in you, or is there something which is embedded in us genetically which gives us an inclination toward this too, or a predisposition perhaps? Well, I mean, we're, we're clearly very conformist uh, as, a, as a species. Um, and, uh, you know, children uh, at a very young age uh, learn to con con conform and they learn to impose rules on each other, and, and or they when I say learn to, you know, they do it almost spontaneously. So that certainly suggests that they, you know, the, the basic 
norm psychology, as uh, it's been called, uh, has been inculcated into us. But what you're asking, uh, are there specific versions of what's right and wrong? Uh, and um, I'm not I'm not convinced about that. You know, that th th there might be uh, something like um, uh, involving theft, you know, some very basic principles uh, involving harming each other. But but uh, most of these things are subject to some kind of fluidity. Yeah. So I guess f some sort of inherent feeling of fairness, uh, maybe um, like disgust aversion or your disgust threshold stuff like that you know if you were to do something that made you feel very traumatized yourself you know the fact that uh, soldiers deal with things like ptsd would be pretty maladaptive if we were just supposed to be uh proactive um how would you say unboundedly proactive aggressors uh you would just come back and yeah why would there be an issue you know, I just I did the thing that I did the thing that I'm supposed to do. Um, so speaking of that, actually, has there ever been? Have you ever discovered, or could you imagine a situation in which proactive aggression was selected against in any animal? Um, well, uh, if you take uh, our two closest relatives, chimpanzees and bonobos, the uh, you can make two strong claims, I think. First of all, that uh, bonobos have much less proactive aggression than chimpanzees. And secondly, that their common ancestor was much more like a chimpanzee than like a bonobo. And the reason you can say that is that there's an outgroup, which is the gorilla, and gorillas are much more like a chimpanzee than, than a bonobo in terms of their anatomy and probably their psychology. So what that means is that there's probably been selection against proactive aggression in bonobos compared to chimps. Interesting. Wasn't there something unique about the fact that bonobos had a f female-led coalitionary self-domestication route? Yeah. Can you explain that? Why females? Why not males? You've just we've just spent half an hour explaining about how the Alpha Alliance and the guys and they take down and so on. What power do women have in a very close relative of ours? What power yes, do females right. have? Right. No, it's fascinatingly similar and it's fascinatingly different. Uh, I think it's similar because you get the same evidence of self domestication in the bones in the anatomy of bonobos compared to chimps as you do in humans compared to our ancestors, or by the way, compared to Neanderthals. Um, a difference is that in bonobos, you still have alpha males. Whereas in humans, you don't have alpha males in the primate sense. And so the self-domestication that's happened in human in bonobos does not involve removing the alpha male. Alpha males don't get killed. Uh, and, you know, we certainly don't have a, a really good handle on the dynamic of bonobos, but what you see nowadays is that when a male gets out of hand, he is not taken down by males. He is taken down by females. So you get a male who challenges a female over a piece of food, say, and she gives a squeak, and the five females who are closest all rush to her aid and they all go chasing that male. And he runs off and is, is terrified, and rightly so, because those females can impose a lot of damage. Uh, you know, like any gang, they're pretty effective and they can bite his knuckles off or uh, uh, give him some nasty wounds. Maybe in the end we'll see some evidence of killing like that, I don't know. So there's something very different that's going on in the self-domestication of bonobos from humans, uh, it's not directed at, um, or the current behavior is not directed at um, eliminating the tyrant males. What it is directed at is stopping the males from being aggressive towards the females. What's different? Why? What's the pressure that's different there between humans and bonobos? Well, 
uh, it may not be the pressure that's so different as the ability. So, you know, you could argue that the pressure in bonobos might be just as great for males to take out the tyrant male. Because, and you, and that would be a very fair argument because we know about the distribution of paternity in bonobos. And we know that even you, though you've got this sort of relatively pacific, self-domesticated form, it is still the case that the alpha male is getting just as high a proportion of the paternity as occurs in chimpanzees. Namely, you know, 70% in small groups. I mean, you know, it's really high. Um, but what the bonobos don't have is the human ability for the subordinated, annoyed, frustrated, incel-type males to be able to get together and attack the tyrant. I think because of this difficulty of forming a confident coalition. Presumably those, those males, those underlings, would have the same ability of coordination and coalition as the females, though. It's not like the females have something specific that the males don't. That's true. What the females have, uh, unlike humans, is um, an ability to spend time together on a relatively permanent basis. So that whenever a female is frustrated and annoyed by a particular male, then the fe- there are always females there to be able to uh, attack him. And that's unlike humans, where uh, you know, in all societies, humans break up by day and, and go off in small groups, and, uh, and a man can uh, find an opportunity to beat up on a female uh, when there are no females around to, to support her. I suppose as well, being patrilocal, uh, at least on average, where you know the woman perhaps gets married off to the husband, Kinsh- maybe is displaced slightly geographically away from kin. Kinship issues may help. And then in addition, you know, there's the fact that um, once you've got the Alpha Alliance, who have already shown that they can kill the tyrant male, then once you have language, any male who says, you know, uh, I was attacked by half a dozen females the other day, you know, I can't believe it. And he goes and tells his mates then, and all of a sudden, (coughs) you've got a very powerful male group that can do something about those females. Uh, interesting. Okay, so getting back to the, the morality thing, so I think this is really interesting. <coughs> you mentioned before that um, men, typically throughout history, have come up with, uh, some would say, arbitrary and fantastical solutions and excuses for why they may be given preference in certain areas of life. Does this make the mythology and the storytelling around a lot of this essentially just plausible justifications for what men want to do. Yes, for, for what benefits the, uh, the male alliance. Um, so I, I think the story of human society, you know, a major, uh, major story of human society is that it is designed around uh, what benefits the group of males that have taken power. So they've taken power from the alpha male. Uh, they, um, they, they have a monopoly on violence. Uh, you know, their, their monopoly means that they, one of the rules is uh, we're not going to tolerate violence within our group. Um, so that leads to a series of, of moral principles uh, associated with that. Um, the I think that basically you're right that um, uh, that the morality of a group is uh, intimately associated with uh, what benefits the males as a group, and that might mean that some individuals are, are frustrated because the rules that have emerged out of the the group are not necessarily beneficial for a particular male. You know, the male who is the cleverest or the the strongest or whatever. He has to conform to the rest of the group himself. But from the point of view of the group as a whole, these moral principles work for, for their own benefit. And so, you know, religions are, are of course, you know, very male biased in terms of um, uh, the, the way they work, the, um, uh, the precepts that come down from on high. You know, God, God 
are typically personifications. They're, they are personifications of something. And, and what, are, what are they personifications of? Well, I think the answer is they're personifications of the interests of the male group. A lot of third rails here, Richard. First off, we've come for morality and, and cleanly decapitated that one. And then next up is perhaps the entire institution of religion at large as being a, a more elaborate storytelling justification. But I can completely see the logic. I can completely see how it would be the case that emergently there needed to be a more sophisticated, ethereal, harder to refute. It couldn't be something rational. It couldn't be something that was... Um, provable or disprovable here and now. It couldn't be like the number of, of cows that somebody had killed or whatever. It had to be the, the special trumpet, the magical trumpet of the gods or whatever. It wasn't the, there was something that you said about a, a special path if women walked on a particular path. And, yeah, and yeah. In quite a lot of these societies, small-scale societies, you have areas that are restricted for males only to use. And, uh, and if females even even by accident, you know, not knowing about them because they're a new female in the group or something, walk on the male path, then, then they, they can be, just be killed. Interesting. Because it's so important for the males to uh, maintain complete control over uh, the male cosmology, the male... There was a lot of evidence that you found for even um, kin kin executions or whatever there was a story i think of a, a mother strangling her son in his sleep because he'd slept with somebody else's partner at some point this to me seems like a very uh, this should be selected against incredibly heavily and why, why why would you choose you know in terms of fitness adaptation why on earth are you going to kill your own son as opposed to try and take on maybe the entire it's me and you son let's take on the entire tribe what, what, yes. what's your understanding well, no, there? you're right that this this is very extreme and in terms of the ordinary expectations of um uh, individuals being expected to favor their own kin uh, against non-kin uh, it doesn't really work but i think it what re it reflects is the incredible power uh, of the the dominating group with its ability to impose its own morality on everybody else. And there may come a point at which a you know, cynical um, uh, examination of uh, an appropriate strategy would say, if I support my son who has been irritating others in this group, then he's going to get killed and I'm going to get killed and, and all our family is going to get killed. And it may just behoove me to recognize that this individual is dragging us all down and I'll get rid of him and then we'll all be safe again. The, you know, the, and the, the big picture here is that the ability to kill, the ability of, uh, of a group to develop rules um, that they can enforce is behind so many of the complexities of human society, so complexities and, and uh, patterns that are very different from what we see in any other animal. I think we've just massively underestimated the extraordinary revolutionary effect of the development of capital punishment. It changes all the power dynamics. What happens when we reach a period of human development, of civilizational development, where we now have a surplus of resources? Or actually, here's an even more interesting question. Have you thought about what would have happened, how the local ecology, the local um, resources and mating market could have influenced the response to aggression? So, for instance, if there was a period shortly after a, a, a big war with a, a, a local tribe where there was a high female skewed sex ratio, for instance, or if it was a, a period after an ice age where there was a more abundant amount of food to go around, have you considered how the human aggression response might have been adapted to those kinds of situations? Well, not really, but but the the sort of 
gut, gut feeling I have about this is that uh, male desires, male motivations um, are almost infinite. You know, think about the fact that uh, emperors in various different societies around the world, uh, China, India, Peru, when they get absolute power, uh, you know, they're not quite the same as alpha males in chimpanzees, but they have the power equivalent in some ways. And what do they do? They just get infinite, I mean, essentially infinite numbers of females. So you can take hierarchies in these empires where you look at the most um, powerful individual man and he might have a harem of 10,000 women. And, and he acts like a, um, a breeding bull where uh, two females are brought to him every day uh, whose menstrual periods have been monitored so that they're most likely to be fertile on that day. The logistical nightmare. Yes, and the, and even the emperors themselves complained about uh, you know <laughs> uh, the, the obligations here, but but nevertheless you know th that's what he can go for. And then but then the you know the vice emperor or whatever they called you know the, the the people under him they get a certain proportion, and then under him another proportion, and and so you know all the people in the government hierarchy uh, have got uh, their own uh, rich number of females. The trickle down effect of. Whatever that's going on. Of, of power. Yes. Uh, so when you say, uh, you know, well, so you know, maybe everyone would just sort of stop and give up and and, uh, and make nice if they had lots of access to lots of females. Mm. It seems to me more likely that what would happen is that that uh, they would just all be competing for all of these females again. Desire would expand appropriately. I So I can see that absolutely in a post-agricultural world. The interesting thing to fold in was the first question that I bailed out of, which is, there has to be some sort of a change in terms of how tyranny or aggression is treated when one individual can start to accumulate far more resources. Once we get to the stage, once we've got the agricultural revolution, once we stop being nomadic, once we stay still for long enough to actually be able to accumulate defensive fortifications and stores of food and uh, all the rest of the stuff, it seems to me that that would maybe not be a hockey stick the same as the introduction of language, but should have made a change to the dynamic of how humans relate to each other sufficiently. Because before that period, how many women are you going to support? A hundred thousand years ago, how many women can one man support realistically? Uh, yes, that's right. And of course, um, you probably know about the, the famous studies, the Tiwi of Northern Australia, uh, where uh, you had hunters and gatherers in general, becoming more polygynous as you re went further north in Australia. Um, and as you go further north towards the warmer regions, uh, you uh, find that it's increasingly possible for women to uh, look after themselves without any male input uh, in terms of the accessibility of plant and animal resources. And the animal resources are, are generally fairly small. They're sort of lizards more than... Um, Buffalo, you know, mm, mm. there weren't any, um, and uh, and you had intense polygyny with uh, men having say twenty wives, um, and the support all went in the opposite direction to the one you were talking about. That is to say, a man would say, "Oh my goodness, you know, I, I'm not going to get enough food unless I have at least five wives, and you know, now I have twenty, then I get lots of food because the women were supporting the men." Wow, it's not men supporting women. Um, but so you is, had, that, is that is is a, is an these element? These are and gatherers with intense polygyny. Is that an element of the fact that when there is a surplus of resources, the requirement for women to date suboptimally, for want of a better term, there is less pressure for them to do that because them on their own are more likely to be fine. They don't need the male protection in this way. Well, yes, they don't need the male support. And, and yes. so, you know, in contrast to what you had in Africa, uh, probably, where uh, there were large animals that did contribute significantly to the economy and where men were needed to be able to provide for females in that way, um, where, where that doesn't happen, then um, 
uh, as we we're saying, uh, it's increasingly possible for a few men to dominate access to the the females. And you had a very interesting system where um, it was the the elders uh, were really quite old, like uh, you know forty years old. Almost um, like a gerontocracy um, type thing. It was very gerontocratic. That's absolutely right. Yeah, relatively few old men. Uh, they had a hard time of it because um, you know there's no lights, of course. So they'd uh, they'd go to sleep, uh, go to bed, uh, or they'd have the evening meal um, with uh, maybe twenty five fires for the twenty five women that are the wives of a particular man. And it was all too easy for some women to go out of the firelight and go and meet bachelors uh, and uh, and get into trouble that way. And so the bachelors were supposed to uh, to go off a long way. Um, they were supposed to go and live in a different part of the bush for uh, you know ten years or something before they were allowed to come back and and be part of the system at all. Have you considered in the modern world? the changing dynamics that we have of um, peace, relative peace in our time, the uh, lack of requirement for men to do both big game hunting and warfare, uh, the condemnation generally of both proactive and reactive aggression, whether that be uh, socially or legislative, legislatively, um, and also the increasing female achievement and independence that they have from men that, in terms of resources, education, employment, you know, a, a sperm donor and a good education will get you a long way in being able to raise a family without the requirement of a male. Have you considered what the goodness paradox or the um, approach, our humanity's approach to aggression looks like in this current version of civilization that we're in now? Well, I agree that it, it raises um, questions about male roles. And, you know, I see all this stuff in the news about um, adolescent boys uh, feeling frustrated uh, that um, they're not able to to be as male as <clears throat> their perceptions uh, would like them to be. Uh, and the way that um, Andrew Tate and his philosophy are incredibly, appallingly appealing to to boys. And I agree that it, it kind of raises some really big issues about um, uh, about the future, about whether or not it's going to be satisfactory for males to be you know, increasingly um, powerless, uh, increasingly uh, unnecessary. I, 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 but I've not I've not considered you know exactly what's going to happen. I mean. Um, it's not always easy to appreciate, I think, the fact that the same essential dynamic as you can see in a group of hunters and gatherers that is, you know, 20 people is, I think, at play in our society today in the sense that uh, we have uh, moral and institutional systems that uh, keep violence uh, in its place. And if you are violent in a small hunter-gatherer society, then you will be subject to a, an arrow in the back, um, and everyone will say, yes, he deserved it, you know, or, or maybe plan it in advance. And the same happens nowadays with us. If you are too violent, then you will end up nowadays in prison, um, and presumably that will lead to a reduction in your reproductive success. And we all... Uh, have developed a whole series of sensitivities to these complex rules that um, keep us in in control. Now, you know, you're asking, is it possible that um, these rules will get so burdensome and so at variance with our uh, male spontaneous tendencies to, uh, you know, do the equivalent of go hunting, um, that... Uh, that somehow the system will break down. I, you know, I tend to doubt it, but but you know, it's a it's a future that that we haven't been to before. So you know, who knows what's going to happen? I went for dinner a few weeks ago with David Buss, and I was sat down, and I've been pondering this question for a, 
good while now. Um, Richard Reeves, who wrote a book called Of Boys and Men. He's a policy wonk type guy from Washington, D.C., but wrote a phenomenal book. It's very short. You'd, you'd, you'd really enjoy it. It's called Of Boys and Men. Uh, just one, uh, New Yorker book of the year 2022, actually. Mm. And, um, I asked the question of David and his partner, who is a very uh, accomplished uh, social psychologist, um, what use are men in 2023? Really, what, what role do they have when big game hunting and coalitional warfare is outsourced to the state, you know, in the form of armies and, and law and a supermarket? Really, really, what role do we have? Because we're seeing women outperform men in education. On average, they're more conscientious. They have fewer geniuses, but they also have fewer uh, ADHD, uh, autistic, r retarded members. Uh, then when you sit them down and you put them into an office, the kind of knowledge-based office work that we have now also seems to lend itself towards women's uh, predispositions, at least in part. Um, and now that they are able to achieve educational and employment parity with men, they don't need them quite so much anymore. And then the previous roles that men had that they would have relied on, the you know, that Andrew Tate sort of gives a, a little bit of a nod and a wink to, those are no longer required of men. And kind of the the, the nerfed kiddie version of that, which was um, capitalistic, conquering and upward mobility or if it was you know 500 years ago you were commanding a legion of serfs or you were a baron or whatever right you know whatever hierarchy you choose to have that was still very easy for male men to dominate all of those have fallen away now and you know i asked one of my smartest friends who's thought about intersexual intrasexual dynamics mating attraction for what 40 years 50 years something like that and he didn't have an answer and I think that folding in your work around aggression, around where morality may come from, uh, adds what may be a uh, slightly bleak but very interesting new area of spotlight onto this discussion, which is that a lot of the morality that we were working off of the back of was built in order to protect some of men's interests. And now in a world during which those interests have been emancipated so much that anybody can access them, uh, the gatekeeping no longer works. We've seen the downfall of all of the things that we spoke about, you know, whether it's spirituality with or without religion, you know, the, the advent of, a, of scientism, the rationalist world, uh, all of this is slowly just chipped away and degraded at all of the different little gatekeeping elements that we had that would keep this going. And then the final uh, decapitation was the fact that women didn't need men for resources anymore. And yeah, I do, I, I'm going to Doha, it looks like, to do a debate on, literally on masculinity. They want me to be the, like the card carrying traditional masculinity is under attack and we need to stop it from happening. Mm. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that I actually agree with that position, which is maybe going to make me bad as a, uh, debater for that side, but I certainly do feel a lot of sympathy, both for myself and for a lot of other young men who go, well, okay, definitions and roles within society need to change to adapt to what is happening in the society, right? It, 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 would, it would be pointless for us to all value a man based on how much of a warrior he, he is when we're not at war, for instance, right? So you need to reflect the roles with the ecology or with the local environment, whatever's going on right now. But you can get to the stage where you erode and dissolve and evaporate so many of the constituent parts of what a concept used to mean to the point where it essentially means nothing anymore, where the word masculinity would, would not resemble anything compared with what it would have done previously. Therefore, it's basically, it's, it's a moot point, and we now need a new word to talk about what men are. Um, so yes, very, very, very interesting. Richard, I, I absolutely adore your work. I think this is, this is a, a fascinating intersection of morality, of anthropology, of evolution, of psychology, of all of the stuff that you've gone through. Uh, are you working on anything next? Can we expect anything from you soon? 
I think I'll probably develop the ideas about patriarchy um, a little bit more. And and I think the, so. The questions that you're you're raising are are really big. You know, are really important about what is the role of men. The one thing you, that I thought that you didn't mention just then is uh, is kind of an odd one in a way. But um, men have got a tremendous role as fathers of sons. Yes. Uh, you know, helping to to bring to rear sons mm-hmm. because it does seem as though sons benefit very often from having a, a male father figure. But um, but it's a funny thing that because the fathers very often don't know exactly what it is that they're trying to do. Correct. In in raising those, and it's not upheld. It's not high status. You know, to be a stay at home dad is still not high status. It's not high status for men to other men, and it's not high status for men to their partner. Yes. So we also right. have this evolutionary mismatch of relationships where the woman out earns the man the man is 50 percent more likely to need to use erectile dysfunction medication it's twice as likely to end in divorce it's four times as likely to end in divorce if she contributes more than 80 percent of the household income all the way down i mean i wasn't literally thinking that that he has to be a stay-at-home dad but but just to be to be a dad at all you Mm -hmm. know because i mean i think one of the fascinating uh problems going to arise in the pretty near future is that Women are not going to need men for reproduction. Yes, yes, that's that's no, already that's uh, already happening. I have a friend who has got a PhD. She's a self-made millionaire, thirty-seven years old. Uh, she's done not IVF, but whatever embryo selection, sperm donor thing, and she's she's ready to go. So that's that's halfway there, but I, I bet you that it won't take many decades before we don't need sperm at all. How would that work? What would you do? Well, uh, you know, th- there are um, there are birds uh, that are parthenogenetic uh, that uh, that have reproduction without any sperm, and uh, it seems to me that people will increasingly be able to discover what it is about sperm that is necessary uh, for an egg, and it won't be long after that before we figure out a way to have to over fuse and so because... women will be able to have a baby with each other um, oh wow there's no theoretical reason why that shouldn't happen um, we are racing to we must find a new thing for us to do richard or we are racing toward obsolescence i fear well yeah but if you think about the species as a whole yeah you know, i mean this this, is, this gets fantastical but hmm. but it seems to me that ultimately if you really want to envisage a, a stable, a relatively stable future for the human species, I think it'd be a very good idea if if there are no Y chromosomes, because the you know, the, the ultimate source of, of violence is the Y chromosome. The, the w- women are clearly uh, less given to what we might call irrational forms of aggression than men are. And and I, I would think that it would ultimately behoove us in a world of, of new kinds of reproductive technology uh, for a, a moral agreement in whatever kind of social structure we have in the world uh, for the Y chromosome to be put into a test tube like smallpox and, um, and, and for it not to be manifest in... Is that ethical to talk about essentially an entire gender's eugenics removal from the future of civilization there's a question for you well we have decided to touch the final third rail uh just to to leave that there uh i've never even thought about that before uh and i have no idea what i think about it other than i don't quite like the idea of all men going and 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 leaving uh but i also thought before i read your book that human morality hadn't occurred as a byproduct of alpha alliances so We'll see. Uh, Richard, look, I, 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 like I say, your work's fantastic. Um, when you Great come conversation. Up with, Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. When you yep. come up with something new, let's discuss it. I would love to discuss it. And if you do end up coming through to Austin at any point, uh, David has told me that we need to go for dinner. So if you do fly through Texas, make sure that you add an extra day into your trip. If people that are listening want to check out more of the stuff that you do, where should they go on the internet? Um. Well, I, I study chimpanzees, and um, we have a, 
a, uh, a website uh, called uh, Kibale Chimpanzee Project, K-I-B-A-L-E, Kibale Chimpanzee Project, and, uh, and look up The Goodness Paradox. Richard, I appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.